Hey, it's Kevin again, and in this video I want to share with you how you can construct your own CCA Collaboration Home Lab. Now for some people they prefer to rent rack time, they go to one of the major rack rental providers online, and they access equipment remotely. And that's a perfectly valid way of getting your hands on practice, but personally I like to get my hands on the gear. And if that's something that you would like to do as well, I want to share with you specifically in this video how you can interconnect appropriate routers and a switch and servers and IP phones to get yourself a very usable CCA Collaboration home lab. But please understand going in, this is what I'm using, but there are many ways of interconnecting gear to have a very functional lab. So I'm not saying this is the one way to do it and this is exactly how I want you to do it. I want this to serve as a guide for you. I'm using this, but hey, you could use a few different combinations. And as we go through the specifics of what I've got interconnected here, I'm going to share with you some times where you might be able to save some costs. Maybe some of these routers could be 2811 routers instead of 2911 routers. But there's also times where I don't want you to economize. I want you to go ahead and, and buy the Cisco 9971 IP phones, for example. So if constructing your own lab is something that you're interested in, let's get into the specifics. Here's the home lab topology that I built. And again, this is just a guideline that hopefully you can benefit from when you're going out and researching equipment that you might want to use for your home lab. Notice, first of all, that I've got three main sites. I've got an HQ site, and in my mock lab that I came up with, I'm pretending that this is in the 408 area code in the Pacific time zone. I'm pretending that the BR1 side, that's the branch office site, I'm pretending that that's in my home state of Kentucky in the 859 area code, and I'm pretending that BR2 is an international site in Japan. And BR2, notice by the icon, it's configured as a Communications Manager Express router. It also has a Cisco Unity Express module installed. And at the HQ site, we've got a switch, switch SW1, that's connected via a trunk into the HQ router. And connected off of switch SW1, I've got a couple of phones. I've got a Cisco 9971 IP phone, and all of the Cisco 9971 phones that I have in my topology do have cameras installed in them. And we also have a Cisco 7965 IP phone connected into switch SW1. And I've got a server, and this server is running VMware. It's virtualizing a communications manager server publisher, a subscriber, a Cisco Unity connection server, a Unified Contact Center Express server, and an I am in present server. Notice up at BR1 that I've got another server. I've got another server running VMware in my case, and I've got two virtual servers installed here. I've got a Communications Manager Publisher for the BR1 side and a Unity Connection server for the BR1 side. And BR1 also has a Cisco 9971 and a Cisco 7965 IP phone. And at BR2, again, same type of phones, and I've also got a PSTN phone. Actually, below this video, I'm including a link where you can download this topology along with the base configurations for the switch and all the routers in this topology. And you might notice when you're going through that base configuration that I've got a router configured as a PSTN router, and it's configured for a couple of phones, a couple of PSTN phones. When I was originally designing this, I thought, well, in case I want to place a video call out to the PSTN, I'll have a Cisco 9971 phone there as well. And I actually do have that in my topology, but as I was designing my mock lab, I did not have any video calls going out to the PSTN. So that's the reason that I'm not showing the phone here. It's not used in the mock lab that I designed. Now, not shown here is another router. It's the router that's acting as the frame relay switch interconnecting all of our sites. And by the way, you might be looking at some Cisco documentation and think, hold on, what do you mean frame relay? This looks like an MPLS cloud. Well, even though some documentation does hint that the provider is using MPLS, if you look very closely at the lab blueprint documents, it seems like we're connecting into the IP WAN via frame relay connections. So I would suggest that you have a frame relay switch specifically a router acting as a frame relay switch, and that router can also be acting as your PSTN router. Notice that HQ has a T1 connection going into this PSTN router. BR1, it's got a T1 connection. BR2, it has an E1 connection. We're pretending it's in a different country, so we're having an E1 instead of a T1 connection. Also notice that connected to switch SW1, I've got a PC, and it's running the Cisco Jabber for Windows client. And with this topology in mind, and again, there's going to be a link below this video where you can download this topology along with the base configurations of the routers and the switch. But referencing this topology, let's take a look specifically at the equipment that I'm using. First, I've got four routers. 
I've got a PST and router that's also acting as a frame relay switch. And in my case, it happens to be a Cisco 2911. And we'll get into the specific model numbers in just a few moments. But this is the router that's sitting in the cloud that's acting as my frame relay switch and my PST and router. I've also got a router at the BR2 site what I'm pretending is Tokyo. I've got a router at the BR1 site, what I'm pretending is in Kentucky, and my California router, that's at HQ, and we have a switch as well. And that's also at the HQ site. Oh, and you might be wondering, since BR1 and BR2 do not appear to have a separate external switch, how do my phones connect into the router? Are we using router ports to do that? Not exactly. I've got an ether switch module with four ethernet switch ports installed into the BR1 and the BR2 routers. Now let's take a look at each one of these physical devices, beginning with the switch at HQ. If you take a look at the CCA Collaboration Blueprint, you're going to see that the switch you need to be comfortable with is a Cisco 3750X switch. Now here, I'm using a 3750, but it's not of the X variety, it's not the new one. You see, when you have an X instead of a regular 3750, you get some performance enhancements, you get some improvements in how power management is done. However, for your study, I personally don't think it's worth the extra money to get a 3750X when you can just get a 3750. Because one of the things that you're likely to do here is to set up a QoS, quality of service, on this Cisco Catalyst to switch. And a QoS works the same on the 3750 as it does on the 3750X. In fact, it also works the same on a 3560. You might want to take a look at a 3560 if that would be a little more economical for you. And when I say QoS works the same, I'm talking about the fact that we can have two input queues, four output queues, SRR is set up the same way. Now, you do not want to get something like a 3550 or a 2960. No, I would stick with a 3560 or some flavor of a 3750 for your HQ switch. And this switch connects via a trunk connection into the router at the HQ site. And the router that I have is a 2911 router. That's the chassis. And I have 128 meg of flash and I've got a gig of DRAM. Now let's talk for a moment about video. That's one of the big differences in the CCA Collaboration Lab versus the CCA Voice Lab, which was the predecessor to the Collaboration Lab. In order to have a video conference, you've got to have an ISR second generation router, such as a 2900 series router or a 3900 series router. An ISR first generation router, like a 2800 series router or a 3800 series router, you cannot use those routers to be the video conference bridge for you. You see, those routers, the ISR routers, the 2800, the 3800 series, they take PVDM 2s. Packet Voice DSP Module 2s. We need to have PVDM 3s if we're running ISR second generation routers like the 2900 or the 3900 series. And you've got to have a PVDM 3s if you want to do video conferencing. Now what I have installed here in the HQ router is a PVDM 3-128. This is the minimum. If you want to have a video conference set up and you want to use this router as your video conference bridge, at a minimum, you've got to have a PVDM 3-128. Now, just for some extra capacity for other things, I also have a PVDM 3-64 installed. And another word of caution, you might say, well, I don't have a PVDM 3-128, but I've got a couple of PVDM 3-64s. I'll just put those in there and they'll add up to 128. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. You've got to have at least a PVDM 3-128 if you want to set up a video conference bridge. So in my mock lab, I'm having the HQ router act as the video conference bridge. And if you want to do that in your home lab, you've got to have an ISR second generation router. No compromises there. And you've got to have at least a PVDM3-128. And I've also got installed a serial port to get me to the frame relay switch. It's an HWIC-1T. It's going to give me my frame relay serial connection. And I don't want you to use just a regular WIC-1T for this because the speed's not going to be good enough. I want you to use only HWICs, which is the high-speed WAN interface card. Because after all, we're going to be sending video over this link. We want to make sure that we have plenty of bandwidth to do that. And that's my connection to the frame relay switch. What about going out to the PSTN router? Well, we're going to use a T1 connection to get to the PSTN router. And I'm using a VWIC 2 
one MFT T1 slash E1. Now this particular model of card allows me to have one port. That's what the one means in the one MFT. That's one multiflex trunk. I've got one port and the T1 slash E1 says that I can configure it to be either a T1 or an E1. As far as the software and the licensing that I have to have on the HQ router, I've got the IP base license along with the unified communication or the UC license. What about for the BR1 site? In my case, I have another 2911 router. I've got 256 meg of flash storage and I've got a gig of DRAM. Now, can we make some compromises here? Depending on what you want to do in your home lab, yes. You may be able to use here instead of a 2911, you might be able to use a 2811 router. Now, personally, I didn't want to make any compromises when I was setting up this lab. I wanted to make a really robust mock lab. I wanted to be able to do lots of things and not be restricted by having an older router. But if you're on a budget and you want to save a little bit of money, I would say that you don't have to have every router be a 2900 series router. This would be one place where you might compromise. If you can afford to do a 2911, I would do that. But if you're trying to economize, this might be a good time to do that. What kind of PVDM do I have here? I've got a PVDM 316. In fact, I've got a second PVDM 316 installed here. And the serial connection that gets me up to the frame relay switch, that's another HWIC 1T like we had on the HQ router. And I've got a VWIC 2, 2 MFT T1 slash E1. Now here, I've got a couple of T1 or E1 ports. I don't really need that. That's just the equipment that I happen to have on hand. You could certainly get by with a VWIC 2 1 MFT T1 E1 here. And since we do not have an external switch at the BR1 side, I have installed into the BR1 router an HWIC 4 ESW. That's an Ether switch module with four ports. And my IP phones at the BR1 site, they connect into that Ether switch module. The licensing, it's the same as I had at HQ. I've got the IP base and the UC licenses. Let's take a look at the BR2 site. Now here, I have a router that's a bit more expensive. It's just the equipment that I happen to purchase. You could use a different model of ISR2 router, but I'm using a 2921 chassis, and I've got 512 meg of flash storage, and I've got about two and a half gig of DRAM. I've got a PVDM332 installed, and an HWIC 1T. That's my serial link to get up to the frame relay switch. And I've got another VWIC 2, 2 MFT T1 slash E1. That could have been a 1 MFT. I only need one port here. And I've got another one of those four port ether switch modules. Now at BR2, this router is acting as a communications manager express router. And also it's acting as a Unity Express module. It's providing voice messaging services for my BR2 site. Now, the way you can do this with an ISR second generation router is you can have an SM SRE. That's a service module, service ready engine, 700 hyphen K9. And then you buy the software, you buy the Cisco Unity Express software that you install on that module. As far as the licensing, these are the licenses that came with this router. IP base security, you don't need security, but I've got it. UC uh, data, we don't really need that one either. And you do need this one, the CME hyphen SRST license. CME is going to let you make this router a Communications Manager Express router. I'm not actually doing SRST, Survivable Remote Site Telephony, but with this license I could. Now let's talk about economizing here for a moment. I'm going with a Cisco 2921 chassis. Can you economize here? I would say that yes you can. You can go with a 2811 here and you can install a module in the 2811 to run a Cisco Unity Express 8.x. However, you're not going to be installing an SM SRE 700K9. If you get a 2811 router, I want you to get an AIM 2 hyphen CUE. AIM, that's Advanced Integration Module 2, version 2, hyphen CUE for Cisco Unity Express. You want to get an AIM 2 hyphen CUE. Don't get a regular AIM CUE. It will not run version 8.x of Unity Express. The highest it will go is 7.x. You don't want that but this would be a place to economize a little bit. What about the router that's up in the clouds? My frame relay switch and my PSTN router? Well, I've got another 2911 chassis. It's got 128 meg of flash. It's got a gig of DRAM. I've got a PVDM 316. And because this is connecting out to all of my other sites, I need multiple serial ports. And instead of buying three separate one port HWIC modules, what I have installed here is an HWIC 4T. It's got four serial ports. 
and I'm using three of those. One connecting to HQ, one connecting to BR1, one connecting out to BR2. I've also got to have a T1 or an E1 connection after those three sites. So I've got a couple of VWIC2 modules installed. I've got a VWIC2-2 MFT T1 slash E1. I can get a couple of ports out of that. I'm using that for my two T1 ports. And then I've got a VWIC2-1 MFT T1 slash E1. I'm using that as my E1 connection after the BR2 site. As far as licensing, I've got the IP base and UC, Unified Communications. Again, you could do some economization here. You could probably use an ISR first generation router here. However, don't compromise on your serial interface speed. Don't get a regular low speed WAN interface card because you might want to send video between your sites. In fact, you probably do. So make sure you get some sort of a high speed WAN interface card. Well, those are the routers and the switch and the switch modules that I'm using. What about the IP phones? Well, for the IP phones, I suggest that we do not compromise. I suggest that you actually buy Cisco 7965 IP phones and Cisco 9971 IP phones with the camera module. I know it can be a big temptation to look around and see that oh, I've got some 7960s sitting here. I've got a 7940 sitting here. Can I use those? I really suggest you do not. There are so many subtle differences in the way that a 7960 works as compared to a 7965. Please don't compromise on phone models. I want you to be very familiar with these specific models when you set foot in the lab. What about our servers though? Well, I've got a couple of servers. At the HQ site, I'm running VMware. And on that VMware server, I've got a few virtual servers. I've got a communications manager publisher. I've got a subscriber. I've got a Cisco Unity connection server. I've got UCCX, that's Unified Contact Center Express. And I've got an IM and present server. And the server that I'm using has 64 gig of RAM. It's got a terabyte hard drive. It's got a couple of processors running at three gigahertz and they each have four cores. And speaking of processors, let me give you a little word of caution. If you're gonna be going out and buying a new server to run VMware on, I recommend that you go with an Intel based server as opposed to an AMD based server. I don't have anything against AMD, however, you can run into some issues with Communications Manager on an AMD server. It will work for the most part, but you might have some problems with your Cisco Voice Media streaming service, which is used by some of your media resources. You might find that you're unable to get that service to start and to stay started. And there's a way to fix this. I've actually done this on a couple of different VMware servers where I am using an AMD processor. You can boot up on a Linux distribution DVD and you can do a internet search for it and see exactly what you have to do. But you have to go in and edit a file or two. You've got to copy some files over because you're pointing to something like an x86 directory instead of an AMD directory and you've got to change that around. But it's going to be a lot easier if you're just buying one to go with an Intel based server as opposed to an AMD server. If you already have an AMD server and you want to use it, you can. Just remember, you might have to do a little bit of extra configuration in order to get that Cisco IP voice media streaming service to start. I've got another server over at the BR1 site. It's running a communications manager publisher virtual instance and a Cisco Unity connection server virtual instance. Now what I'm suggesting for you is if you have this two server approach that you install some flavor of Linux like I have here along with some flavor of a DNS server like bind. I'm actually running a bind on Linux inside of a Parallels virtual machine running on an iMac. But since that's a very specific configuration, I wanted to be more general for you here. And you can get some free version of Linux, see what DNS server you can install on that, and you'll probably be able to find a YouTube video that will walk you through the configuration. That's exactly what I did. And the reason that you absolutely have to have a DNS server here is that when you install the UCCX server, it demands and it checks to make sure you have a DNS server. It even does a reverse DNS lookup, so you've got to have that configured or you cannot get your UCCX server installed. The hardware is not nearly as powerful at this site as HQ. I've got only 16 gig of RAM. I've got a 700 gigabyte hard drive, a couple of processors still with four cores each, but we're running at 2.4 gigahertz. But because I'm not running as many virtual machines at the BR1 side, it works out just fine. And also connected at HQ, I've got a PC. 
and that PC is running at Cisco Jabber for Windows. You will probably want to set up a Cisco Jabber for Windows client when you're working with your IAM and Present server. So again, here's the big overview of the topology that I've constructed. And again, please look below this video for a link that will let you download this diagram, this topology, along with the base configurations of the Switch at HQ and all of the different routers.